Yes, for the start, um, I wrote the course because I didn't find a book that contains everything I wanted to say, but nevertheless, this is a, a really very good book. Uh, as far as I know, 2012 is the latest edition. I checked yesterday and I didn't find anything more recent. I also found that KU Leuven can, uh, has access to this book, so you can read it online. So it's really very good. It contains way more than I will tell. Just the part about the reconstruction is a bit less uh, than, than I would have liked. Okay, <clears throat> and so here is the basic idea of nuclear medicine. So you have a patient and you have a tracer and the tracer is a molecule that is sensitive to some particular uh, metabolic function that we're interested in and it is radioactive. So we inject it to the patient and then we have all kinds of measure, measurement devices that um, acquire the photons emitted by this tracer. So basically for this emitted radiation, we are transparent and the, the uh, scanners can see through the patient and basically collect information along the lines. And for example, if you uh, inject a tracer that uh, accumulates proportional to bone metabolism, you will get an image like this. And then there is two different flavors of um, tracers. One is uh, single photon emitters. So in every decay of the isotope, a single photon is emitted. And then we have devices that try to detect these individual photons. The other one is positron emission tomography. So here a positron is emitted. It annihilates with an electron and two photons come out and they're kind enough to fly in almost opposite directions. And therefore, if we detect both photons, we know that somewhere along this line, a single atom has decayed. And the advantage is that we get this line automatically, while for a gamma camera, we have to put collimators in front. We'll discuss that later. And then these days, if you buy a PET system, it always comes with the CT system. And if you buy a SPECT system, you can also have it combined with the CT. And Interestingly, uh, the CT uses basically the same mechanism. So here the radioactivity or the, the radiation emitter is just a point source. Here we have the detector. And again, what we measure here is proportional or is determined by the total attenuation along this line. So that means all three devices acquire information along lines. And in all three cases, we will uh, use that information to reconstruct three dimensional images of the patient. Here are the equations, but they will come later and then I will explain them uh, in detail. And so here is the reconstruction principle. So instead of acquiring a single view through the patient, we acquire a lot of them. And if we have those, then we can reconstruct the three-dimensional volume of it. And for example, if you would acquire uh, information just along a single plane, so views of that plane are just one dimensional profiles. If we use all these profiles, we can make a reconstruction of that plane. Okay, so we'll, we'll focus on the technology and on the algorithms, but the important thing in nuclear medicine is actually the tracer. So the, the quality of the image heavily depends on the tracer and what we would really like is that the tracers are extremely specific. So if we have a tumor tracer, we would like it to accumulate only in tumors and nowhere else. If it does that, then it's very specific. We also want high sensitivity, which means that if there is a tumor, we're going to see it. So it should accumulate in large amounts and it should not accumulate in, in uh, well, in other stuff, but that's specificity. And then, of course, we need a good detection system because with a good tracer, we can only make good images if we have a good detection system. This is the part that we will focus on. Okay, so this course is intended for everyone interested in nuclear medicine, but in particular for medical physicists. And so what is their function if they work in a, a nuclear medicine uh, division? One thing is to look after the cameras. Uh, the PET cameras, the gamma cameras, and all the other hardware. And the reason is that these machines are pretty sophisticated. They consist of a lot of components and the characteristics of these components can slowly change. So the quality of the images that they make can slowly degrade. 
And if you don't monitor that carefully, then uh, the danger is that it will start affecting the diagnostic, uh, the quality of the images. Then in nuclear medicine, there is a lot of image processing to be done, uh, reconstruction, image filtering, image analysis. All that is pretty complicated. And uh, all the software have lots of buttons and parameters, and it is useful that there is not only medical doctors who will uh, analyze these images, but also people that are more familiar with uh, these technical aspects to make sure that the images are correctly created. Dosimetry is of course important, but uh, nuclear medicine is mostly diagnostic. So we inject small amounts of tracers and of course we don't want to inject too much. For dosimetry, we basically want to estimate the average dose to the average patient and make sure that that dose is sufficiently low. So it is not very important to know exactly how much dose every individual has obtained, as long as those doses are very small. But in therapy, that's very difficult. Because in therapy, we give amounts of radioactivity, not just to make an image, but to kill a tumor. So we want to give them in huge amounts. And it is important that we give just enough to kill the tumor, but not more than that, because then we will start killing healthy tissue. And therefore, here, dosimetry is much more important than here. And this is currently uh, a, a field of, of uh, where a lot of research is going on. So this is becoming more and more important. And then, of course, if you are in a big uh, nuclear medicine uh, department, you can do lots of research, as is the case in, in our department. A few words on radionuclides. So there are different ways in which atoms, uh, radioactive atoms, can decay. <clears throat> and intuitively speaking, the atoms are radioactive because they're not very happy with the fraction of uh, protons and neutrons in their atoms. And so for example, here we have an atom that has um, more neutrons than it would like, and it would be more stable. It would have a lower energy in its nucleus if that neutron would be uh, replaced by a proton. And the atom can actually do that by uh, converting this neutron to a proton and an electron. And that electron is emitted uh, with uh, significant energy. And that is possible because the, uh, that energy is available because this atom has lower energy than, than the original one. And so this is called beta mean emission for obvious reasons. The, the beta mean is the electron which is emitted. And uh, an important example of an atom like that is uh, molybdenum, which decays to technetium 99M after uh, this, this uh, conversion of neutron to a proton. And the M means that this is technetium. Uh, the, the number of protons and neutrons and electrons is like in technetium, but the M means that it's metastable. So intuitively speaking, you could say, well, this was a good place for a neutron, but not for a proton. So now the internal organization of that nucleus is not optimal and it will reorganize itself. And then it decays to a more stable configuration, which is uh, chemically the same thing. And that is technetium 99, which is stable. Now, if, if this happens uh, within, I think, less than a nanosecond or so, then uh, it is considered part of the radioactive decay. But if it takes a bit longer, then this is considered a separate uh, process, and it's called isomeric transition. And for technetium 99M, this takes about six hours, which is perfect for us because six hours is a good time. It gives us time enough to inject the patient. And it's not so long that a long time after the study, the patient is still being irradiated. Okay, and so what we have molybdenum generators from that technetium 99M is uh, taken and that is in, uh, used to make tracers. And, uh, that is what decays in the body of the patient. And so the energy difference between these two is 140 kilo electron volt, which is emitted as a photon. And this is the photon that we are detecting. All right. <clears throat> and another way, or another problem of a, a, a nucleus can be that it has actually too many protons, and then it can do the opposite thing. It now wants to convert this proton to a neutron. 
And it can do that by eating up an electron, which is called electron capture. And then again, there will be either an isomeric transition or an immediate transition uh, reorganizing this uh, nucleus and a photon is emitted, which is the photon that we would like to use. Uh, here is an example of electron capture, and this is for indium uh, 111. And I also show it to, to show that in addition to the photons that we're interested in, which, which are uh, these photons here, there are a lot of other photons. You see that in a decay, about in about 90% of the cases, we get 171 kilo electron volt photon, which is the one we use for imaging. But then there is a lot of a lot of other stuff going on, and that can be important in particular for transimetry because the patient is not only irradiated by the interesting photons, but by everything else as well. So what is this? Um, well, I'm not a physicist. So I don't know too much about the details, but I'll give a brief explanation. So this indicates a conversion electron. So instead of emitting this gamma, that energy can be used to emit an electron. And a conversion electron K means that an electron from the K shell is emitted. And you see this, it is emitted with a bit less energy than the gamma. And that is because part of that energy has been used to get the electron out of the atom. And once it's out, the rest can become kinetic energy of the electron. And depending on the shell, uh, the, the binding will be stronger. So the amount of kinetic energy available for the electron will be different, but always below that of the gamma, of course. And so you can have this for every, uh, uh, for every photon that is being emitted. In addition, um, there can be X-rays. And this happens if, for example, a conversion electron is emitted. Then there is a vacancy created in the atom, and an electron from a higher shell will come down to fill that vacancy. And so this X-ray called K alpha one is an X-ray that uh, is created because an electron from a higher shell is filling up a vacancy in the K shell. And the difference, uh, the energy difference between those two shells is emitted as a photon. And then similarly, if this happens, instead of emitting a photon, you can also, or not we, the, the atom can also emit an Auger electron, and that is written here. And so this uh, notation means that there was a vacancy in the K shell. An electron from the L shell decided to fill it, so it comes down, and the energy difference uh, between these two is used to emit another electron also from the L shell of the atom. And that there, there is uh, only little energy left for that. All right. And then the other decay that is important is positron emission. So again, here is an atom that is not happy with the number of protons it has, and it wants to convert a proton to a neutron. And instead of eating up an electron, it can do that by emitting a positron. And Positron emission is often found in uh, radioactive isotopes that are light. And so you could think that they have few electrons. So eating up an electron is a bit more difficult, which is why they prefer positron emission. But that explanation is not correct because there are heavy atoms that do positron emission too. So again, this uh, nucleus is more stable than the original one. And that means that a lot of energy is available and therefore this electron is emitted with uh, uh, a lot of kinetic energy, this positron. And it's moving so fast, actually, if you do the calculations, you will find that this positron, even for F18, is traveling faster than light in water, uh, which is why it produces also a little bit of Cherenkov radiation, but not enough to be seen. So that means that it goes at tremendous speed, and at that speed, it cannot annihilate with electrons. So it first needs to get rid of that energy, and it does so by interacting with electrons, causing ionizations while it does that, until it has um, released almost all of its kinetic energy. Then it will meet an electron, and then they both of them will be converted to two photons. And that can happen immediately, or they can create a positronium, which is a kind of particle consisting of a yeah, positron electron that 
uh, together form uh, an unstable particle. And then the energy of both particles is emitted as photons. And almost all of the time that is in, emitted as two photons and they will travel in almost opposite directions. And the reason is that um, both the electron and the positron at the time of annihilation uh, have uh, low kinetic energy and low impulse. And that impulse needs to be preserved. So the impulse of the two photons needs to be the same as the impulse of these two particles. It is small and therefore the vector, uh, some of these two vectors must be almost zero, but not exactly, which is why there is a very small deviation from 180 degrees. Okay, <clears throat> so we have to deal with radioactivity. And I, uh, I think it's not important to uh, memorize everything that is being said here. The focus is on understanding. But if you want to memorize things, this is a good thing to memorize, which is that one millicurie equals 37 megapicarel. So we all should be using megapicarel. But um, until recently or until well, 10 years ago, millicurie was the favorite unit. And it's very hard to switch from a unit that you know well. So we have to know them both until the, the millicurie gets less popular. So 37 megabecquerel means 37 events per second. So becquerel is basically hertz per second. Now imagine that at a given time you have n particles and uh, n radioactive atoms. Then the physicists have found that the probability that one of these atoms will decay is constant over time. So they don't get old or something. Each second, they have the same, exact the same probability that they will decay. And in a situation like that, when the chance of some event to happen is uh, constant over time, you always get um, Poisson noise, which I will uh, explain later. Uh, from this, one can also compute how quickly that radioactivity will decay. So we can write that the change of the number of particles is proportional to the number of particles you have. It is proportional to the time because the chance that they will decay is constant over time. And then it is proportional to some constant, which is related to the atom. Some atoms have shorter half-life, they will decay faster than others. That is this alpha. And then, as you know, you can move this dt to the other side and then do the integration. And with a little bit of work, you will find that the number of atoms that are left, that, that are still radioactive after a particular time, equals the number of radioactive atoms that you had at the start times an exponential. Um, and, but instead of using this alpha, which has uh, units one per second, we prefer to use half-life because it's more intuitive. And so you can quickly check that uh, introducing this half-life also requires this, this uh, logarithm of two, of course. So these two are the same and this alpha equals logarithm of two divided by the half-life. So if we start at zero with 100 atoms, then after one half-life, 50 are left. After two half-lives, 25 are left. So this decays very quickly but in theory, it gets never to zero. So there will always be some left. And as I said, <clears throat> the other thing that one can deduce from the fact that the chance of a decay is constant over time is that the noise uh, that we have will be Poisson noise. This means the following. So suppose we have good reason to believe that on the average, lambda photons will be detected or lambda atoms will decay, for example, uh, during a particular period. Now, if we actually do measurements, then we will see that sometimes we will get a bit more, sometimes a bit less, but on the average, it will be lambda. And the reason that we don't measure always the same is that this is a quantum mechanical process. So it is uh, a random process. We can describe it with probabilities, but we cannot uh, describe it exactly deterministically. So the best we have is this distribution, which says that the probability to uh, measure, for example, n photons when you expect lambda is given by this expression. It looks a bit weird, but if you forgot about it, then you can uh, 
refabricated by recalling that lambda n over, uh, over the faculty of n. If you sum that from one to infinity, it's actually the series expansion of exponent of lambda. So that means if I sum this over all possible n, I get e minus lambda to e plus lambda, which is unity, and that's mandatory because this is a probability distribution, so it should integrate to one. So it is e minus lambda times the uh, term from the series expansion of the exponent. Still, it looks weird, and we're almost more used to Gaussians than in addition. Gaussians are very convenient mathematically because they are um, they are pretty uh, inert to mathematical operations. If the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian, the convolution of two Gaussians is a Gaussian. So for that, Gaussians are very convenient to work with. And therefore, it's very useful to know that the Poisson uh, distribution is pretty similar to a Gaussian distribution. But of course, a Poisson distribution has only a single variable, which is the expectation, which is this lambda here, the number of events that we expect. And a Gaussian has two uh, parameters. It has a mean and a standard deviation. And Poisson remembers the Gaussian, provided that we choose the, the variance of that Gaussian equal to the mean of the Gaussian. That means if we have, if we expect um, 100 events, then if we do measurements on the average, we will see 100 events, but the variance on those measurements will be 100. Therefore, the standard deviation will be 10. So we expect about 100 events, but Standard deviation will be 10, so it's entirely normal that you would measure 90 or 110. It would be very weird to measure 50 because that would be five standard deviations. The chances of that to happen is extremely small. Okay, so here is the expression of the Gaussian. Now, of course, a Gaussian uh, can have uh, any value a Poisson is about events. And so that means that in that way, they're fundamentally different. There are only meaningful probabilities for integer values because you cannot have half an event and you also cannot have a negative number of events. So the Poisson is given by these little dots here and it only exists for integer values while the Gauss exists everywhere. And you also see that the fit of the Gauss to the Poisson is not perfect. And so the further you go away from zero, the better the fit. So you can think of a Poisson not only as an integer distribution, but also a distribution that refuses to become negative. And as we push it towards zero, it becomes more and more asymmetrical. So depending on the accuracy you want, uh, you may only introduce that approximation provided that you have enough events uh, for your approximation to be accurate. And here you see that effect of Poisson noise. So these are uh, a few views taken from uh, a, a pet uh, acquisition. And so I zoom in this one, and then you see this salt and pepper noise. So all pixels have different values. That is because this is a Poisson measurement. If you would do that measurement again, it would look very similar, but black points may have turned uh, gray or white and the other way around. So, as you know, if we want to have better accuracy, we typically measure longer or we use higher amounts of those. And here you can see why that is. If we expect to see lambda photons, we know that the standard deviation on that value will be the square root of lambda. So that, that means if we, well, that means that the signal to noise ratio, the signal is lambda and the noise is square root of lambda is proportional or is equal to the square root of lambda. So if we measure uh, four times longer, we will get on the average four times as many photons, the signal to noise ratio will be uh, twice as large. However, the noise goes up. So it's not true that the noise goes down. If I measure longer, I get more signal, but also my standard deviation goes up, not down, but it goes up slower than the signal, which is why we gain. Now, <clears throat> every now and then we have to make computations with Poisson variables. For example, you, as we will see later, you may do uh, an acquisition 
for a particular energy with a gamma camera. And then thinking about scatter correction, you also do an acquisition at lower energy. And maybe you want to add or subtract such images. That means that if you look at the individual pixels, they are all Poisson distributed. So we're going to make linear combinations of Poisson variables. So it's useful to think what is going to happen to the standard deviation if we do that. Now, if N1 is a Poisson uh, realization so with expectation lambda 1, and N2 is also Poisson realization, meaning that these two are just measurements uh, from uh, this amount of, of activity, then if we sum them, it's easy to show that the result is still a Poisson variable. And intuitively, it would be hard to be otherwise, because suppose that I start doing a measurement, and after acquiring N1 photons, I say, my measurement is done. But then I decide, oh, no, maybe I'll just happily continue measuring a bit, and I measure N2 more photons. So I could say, oh, from here on, this is a separate measurement. So then both would have to be Poisson variable. But I could say, no, 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 actually, I never stopped measuring. The combination of the two is a single measurement. So clearly, that has to be a Poisson variable, too. If you check the mathematics, it's correct. So that means if I add two Poisson variables, I have to add their variances. And the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So I have to uh, take the square root of the square of their standard deviations. But you should not forget that this is true for additions, but not for subtractions. If I subtract two variables, I cannot subtract the noise. The noise is independent. It will always add up, meaning that on the average, it gets worse. You can be lucky, and sometimes it cancels. But on the average, it doesn't cancel. It makes things slightly worse. And it's very easy, again, to show that uh, the, the noise just grows the same, no matter if you add or subtract um, the variables. So that's important. If you have two images and we subtract them, the signal goes down because we subtract two positive values, but the variance will go up. So the signal to noise ratio will degrade. So we have to be careful with too many calculations on noisy data because in the end, we will have lots of noise propagated. Also in, in that PDF course, there is another appendix which talks about noise propagation. I think in principle, all of us have learned this at school, but not, not all of us may remember it all the time. So it's useful to check it. So the course tells you what to do for, um, if you take linear combinations. So maybe A times N1 plus B times N2. It's pretty easy to compute the variance, but it's worth checking how to do it. Similarly, we may want to compute products of Poisson variables. And there too, we can easily propagate the noise. So it's useful to have a look at that appendix too. 